It's great to be with you. It's great as always to be worshiping, to be thinking about um, the way in which God moves and stirs and acts um, in our lives and around us. Uh, Some of you were here when I arrived back in the summer of 2006, um, which is really hard for me to imagine that it has been that long. Um, For those of you who were here, you will know that the church had gone through some rather significant struggles and was kind of emerging out of those. But one of the struggles that was ever present, at least in front of me, was a remaining $5 million of debt on our new, what was then our new facilities, our administration building and our Life Center. And I say was ever in front of me because you all know I am a finance person by background. And every time I looked at the monthly reports, I saw this huge mortgage payment going out. So in the first year or so, we were able to pay down about a million dollars of that to go from $5 million to $4 million. But during that first year, I had numerous meetings with people who continued to remind me that if we could not do something about that debt, we would seriously impede our ministry and our mission because $4 million of debt carries a large mortgage payment, which at that time I think was 7 or 8% or 6 or 7%. It was very high. And so I was ever aware of, Lord, what are we going to do about this? $4 million of debt. The summer of 2008, Daryl Bryant, our pastor of administration, emailed me and said, Paul, I have some news to share with you. He may have texted it to me. I don't really remember if it was a text or an email. The gist of it was this. One of our church members who has passed away recently is, has left out of their estate four and a half million dollars for La Jolla Presbyterian Church. I wanted to weep. What a generous gift. But with generosity always comes decisions. So we gathered as the elders and said, what do we do with four and a half million dollars? And the elders came out of that meeting after much discussion and much conversation saying two things. The first thing that we're going to do is to pay down the remaining debt so that every time we walk around, we don't think about how much debt we have on that facility that is behind me. And the second thing is we are going to set in motion, whenever this church receives an undesignated bequest, we will tithe. We will give 10% of it to our mission partners. And so that meant for a select group of people on the mission committee, they got to give away $450,000 to our mission partners for the work they were doing around the world. An incredible legacy. But it brings up two themes that we are going to be talking about this morning. One is the theme of generosity, and the second is what do we do in response? What are the decisions that we make in response to generosity? Now, I know some of you are thinking, Paul, you're missing an incredible opportunity to talk about legacy giving. Don't worry, I'm going there right now, okay? Because one of the things that I find fascinating, and it is, it is a fact, that when we look at studies of how people give and the charities that they donate to, oftentimes the religious institutions they give to, while they are living, is in their top one or two of the donations that they give. But oftentimes when they leave this earth, guess what? The religious institutions get nothing. Because in their estate planning, they just, I don't know. I don't know if they don't think about the church. I don't know what the thought is. And so I've always said to people, there's a couple ways I think about legacy giving. And we're going to be talking more about this. This is just kind of the entry for you all to start thinking about that. One of the goals we had two years ago pre-COVID was to spend some time thinking through legacy giving, and we had everything ready to launch. And then uh, as things have happened, COVID happened, and we've kind of put that on hold, but we'll be talking about that in a few months. But I say to people, I'm like, there's a couple things I think about when it comes to to your legacy, because we all care about our legacy. We want our kids to know about our legacy. We want our grandkids to know about that. We want others to know about that. But we talk about that oftentimes in the way in which people give at the end of their life as well. And so I say to people, I mean, like, there's two ways that you can think about it. There's probably a hundred ways you can think about it. 
But one of the things is, is, is in that legacy, in that estate, you can either think about, well, maybe I should just leave a final tithe, the final 10% of the estate to the church as one of the places that was super important to me. Or what I've encouraged a lot of our folks to do is say, what, would I, what could I give that would help to endow my pledge? Because the bottom line is when you are a pledger or when you are giving annually and you go to be with Jesus and you get to celebrate that great and wonderful party, that gift doesn't always stay with the church. So anyway, that's it for today. Just a little bit of a little nudge to get you thinking, right? Because you know I never miss an opportunity to talk about money because I think it's important. And our text today, as Scott alluded to, is around this idea, and as Katina actually was singing about, of what do we do with what has been entrusted to us, that when we are blessed, when we receive the generosity of God, how do we respond? So our story, our parable we're gonna look at is about making a decision, making perhaps a bad decision, but let me remind you of where we are. Okay, so we got the map up here again because we're four weeks now into this sermon series I think we have the map up here. If not, you just have to imagine that there's a map. There we go. Okay. So you remember Jesus is making his way from Capernaum up in the north all the way down to Jerusalem down in the south. There were three routes, remember? Yes, Yes, Pastor, we remember. Yes, we remember. There were three different ways that you could make it from the north to the south. Two of them were rather safe, but they took a longer time. The red line and the green line describe those. There's a white line going right through the middle, which you may or may not be able to see, that takes you right through the middle of Samaria, which was the hatred, the, 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 the most dreaded place to go through for a, for a Jewish person because Samaritans and Jews did not get along. And Jesus says, guess which path we're taking? We're going right through the middle because I wanna show you as my followers what it looks like to do ministry and mission in a culture that does not understand you, that does not get you, that does not always appreciate you. And the great thing about Jesus as you have been working through this series, I suspect we're talking about a lot of stories. How does Jesus talk about the kingdom of God? He tells a story. How does Jesus talk about being faithful? He tells a story. So today we hear a story that is a rather, um, I I honestly, I told Shannon the other day, I said, I have never preached from this parable. And there's probably a good reason for that. I mean, I I laugh at myself. I took like the two most popular parables the last two weeks, Good Samaritan, the prodigal uh, prodigal God, or the the, the lost sons, whatever. Um, Well, this morning is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Bill already gave you some haunting chords as we were singing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, to prepare you for this text, because if you recall, the rich man is very rich and has done very well here on earth, but he finds himself in Hades, the place of the dead, while Lazarus gets carried to the bosom of Abraham. And it's not so much, and, I, and, and if you're here today thinking, great, Paul's going to talk about heaven and hell, right? Um, I I always have to joke, my buddy Gene Day in Lubbock, Texas, told me I could never say hell correctly. Because when you live in Texas and you say the word hell, it's a three-syllable word, right? Hell, like I just never could quite get that that connotation correctly. So um, anyway, but it's not so much about heaven and hell as it is about generosity and decision. So here we go, here's our text. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angel carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. That sounds disgusting to me, by the way. Have you ever thought about like putting your finger in water and sticking it in somebody else's tongue? Isn't that what it said? Yeah, just making sure that, that I'm reading that correctly. Because I am in agony in this fire. 
But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. So this parable, this story that Jesus tells is not unique to Jesus, although the ending of the parable is unique. The story is a well-known story, a folkloric story of, and found in Egyptian context, found in Jewish context. Jesus changes it up a little bit because the, the parable typically says, hey, you better l- examine how you're living here on earth because it will have eternal consequences. And typically the person who asks someone to come back, they come back. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. The hearts are too hardened. Someone rising from the dead will not be enough. Context always matters. Jesus is talking to the religious leaders who have done a phenomenal job of justifying their status and their wealth. They were the first of the prosperity gospel people, okay, that if you lived correctly, if you lived faithfully, if you were obedient, then you would be blessed. But Jesus recognized that there was something missing. So actually in Luke chapter 16, a couple of verses earlier than what we just read, Jesus had warned the religious leaders. This is verse 13 of chapter 16 after Jesus tells yet another parable. He says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, the Pharisees, who loved money, heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. You know, Jesus had a great way of stirring things up with the pastors and the priests and the elders. He had no problem calling them out because he knew the condition of their heart. But what had happened over time was the religious leaders, the Pharisees, had taken certain scriptures as often the prosperity gospel does, and said, these are what we cling to. We are blessed because we do such a great job of taking care of others, because we are so faithful in being obedient to the law. And and in in my opinion, I mean, there is some biblical truth to that. I wanted to look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, which would have been one of their major verses that they would have held on to. The blessings that come from being obedient. Okay, so this is the very end or near the very end of Deuteronomy chapter 8, as Moses is continuing on in his sermon, he says this, this is verse 1, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, so listen to this, if you fully obey God, you carefully follow all his commandments I give you today, the Lord your God, and here come the blessings, will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come to you, will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. And notice there is a colon there, right? So here come the blessings. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed, the crops of your land, the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds, the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You'll be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but flee from you in seven. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything that you put your hand to. 
the Lord will bless you in the land he is giving you. That sounds pretty good, right? So if you were wealthy, if you had money, if you had privilege, guess what that meant? You had been faithful. You had been obedient. You had kept the laws. You had kept the commandments. The Psalms are very clear. They say, the wicked will not prosper. That's Psalm 1. That's how it begins, right? So you could very easily come up with this notion of saying, well, you know, wow, I am so faithful because look at all that I have. Remember when Job lost everything and his good friend showed up and says, what the heck did you do wrong, right? You've lost everything. You must not be faithful. You must not be obedient. It's all been taken away from you. But the religious leaders were clinging to Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and following. We only read the first eight verses. The problem is this. They forgot about Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 7 and 8. And I'm only going to read a portion of Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17, 5. Wait, that can't be right. 15, 7 through 8. There we go. Okay. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Whoops. Forgot about that one. Do you keep reading through that? Every seven years, you are to forgive everyone's debts. Do you keep reading past that? You, well, actually, if you back up to Leviticus, remember the year of Jubilee? Well, of course you don't because the people of Israel didn't remember the year of Jubilee. Every 50th year, all debts were, be to, were to be forgiven, all slaves were to be freed, and all land was to be returned. Guess how often that happened in the nation of Israel? Never because it would have been too costly, because I've worked hard, I've accumulated all this. God is faithful, and I have been faithful, so therefore I deserve this. And Jesus said, no. No. No, you've missed the point. The rich man who fed at his table daily who wore fine linen clothes and purple cloth, never got it. Okay, we're gonna come back to him in just a moment, the rich man. I wanna talk about Lazarus for a moment. Let me first say this. In Jesus' days, dogs were not man's or woman's best friend. You did not take them everywhere you went to eat, you did not walk them around and feed them better food than you eat at your own table. I know that as one who has two dogs that I'm like, man, this food costs a lot of money to feed these little rats that we own and call dogs. I'm kidding. My wife's probably listening and I'm in trouble now. So um, anyway, but man, dogs were not people's best friends. They were seen as impure. They were seen as unclean. They were seen as scavengers. And perhaps some of you actually see dogs the same way. I don't know. But it, they were not these cuddly little creatures that we all have and love and, and care for. So that, that's the first thing about Lazarus. Second thing is this. How many parables that Jesus tells does he give a name to somebody in the parable? <laughs> One time in all the stories that Jesus tells, there is only one name that is ever given in a parable, and that's the name of Lazarus. Now, Lazarus comes from the Hebrew name Eleazar, which means the one whom God helps. And there's a strange connection because if like you're thinking, well, why is Abraham involved in this story that Jesus tells? It's because if you go back to Genesis chapter 15, you discover that Abraham's top servant was named, guess what? Eliezer, which then becomes Lazarus when we move into the Greek and the New Testament. Eliezer was responsible for everything that Abraham had, as well as later in Genesis 24 for finding Isaac a wife. 
So if you look at Genesis 15, Genesis 24, you see this connection between Eleazar, which is, becomes Lazarus, and Abraham. So why does Jesus give him a name and not give the wealthy man a name? Like, it's kind of odd. Unless if Jesus is really trying to drive home the point that even though Lazarus was a poor beggar who had literally nothing, that even though everybody passed him by, including the wealthy man, that there was one person who saw him. There was the God above who knew him and knew his name, who said to him, you belong. Because at his death, he is immediately carried up into the heavens while the rich man is literally buried in the ground and descends to Hades. There is something significant, I think, in the naming of Lazarus. He is the one whom God helps, and I would say the one whom God sees. And I want it to be very clear today that God sees each and every one of you. Whether you feel like your whole life you've been stepped over You've been walked past. No one has ever called your name. No one has ever acknowledged you. No one has ever gone out of their way. No one has ever picked you. God knows you. And God loves you more deeply than you could possibly imagine. This is the generosity of our God. The Apostle Paul describes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 26 through 30, using these words. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us, and we use this verse a couple times in our last sermon series, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. The Apostle Paul says, think of who you were before Jesus. Most of the followers, those early followers of Jesus were nobodies. I always love the image of the disciples. They were not the best of the best. They were not in the top 10%. They were not the brightest of the brightest. They didn't have the right family. They didn't have the right education. They were day laborers, and whom does Jesus call to follow him? These fishermen, they probably failed out of Torah school, right? They didn't have a priest. If they were super successful, they would have had a rabbi. They would have had a priest that they followed, and they had none of that. But Jesus says, I see you. I know you, I love you. So what do we do with the blessing? You see, this is the, 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 the second part of this, this idea that if we get the generosity of Jesus, that Jesus sees us, that Jesus knows us, how do we respond? You see, the parable that Jesus tells is not so much about heaven and hell as it is about Jesus saying, look, I am right here in your midst, All the law, all the prophets, all of that points to me, to the arrival of the Messiah, to the one who's come to bring you salvation. What are you going to do with that? Do you recognize the gift you have been given? What do we do with the generous offer of God? And let me say something here very quickly because I know that some of you are like, 
Well, I feel like you can't kind of came down hard on people who have who have stuff or people who have money. Um, well, I didn't. Jesus kind of does that, not me. But anyway, I just want to make that clear. Like, it's not just me because I, I recognize. Like, I got to keep every you know keep this. It's not money. The issue. I mean, I I, I used to get so frustrated when people would be like, well, you know, Paul says in First Timothy that um, that that money is the root of all evil. I'm like. The Apostle Paul never says that money is the root of all evil. What does Paul say? It is the love of money. It is the lust of money. It is the wanting more of money that is the root of all (coughs) kinds of evil, which we can all attest to. The problem with this rich, wealthy guy who has no name is that he kept acquiring and then he kept stepping right around Lazarus or stepping over him, never acknowledging him until when? When he is in, all of a sudden, guess what? Guess when he knows Lazarus' name? When he's in Hades, right? He never acknowledged him. And oh, all of a sudden, he's burning up in Hades. It's like, Lazarus, right? I know your name now. A little too late, sorry, but I know your name. But he never called him by name. He just simply walked by. And I think Jesus is saying to those religious leaders, you have been financially blessed. Don't think you've earned it. But there is a responsibility that comes with that. And I think for us as followers of Jesus, we must always be keeping our eyes open for those in need. And we know that we can't respond to every single thing, and I want to relieve you of that thought. Jesus himself did not heal everybody. He did not give everybody something. But he did heal, and he was generous. And I think for us, it is a good reminder that we can't be overwhelmed by all the needs But when there's someone on the side of the ditch, like we read about in the Good Samaritan, or when there is a beggar lying on the road, or when someone cries out for help, we can at least acknowledge them, whether we know their name or not. Because God has been so generous with us. Now, there's one more part of this story that we want to look at, and then we're going to wrap wrap things up. And this has to do with Jesus continuing to push on the Pharisees of saying, you don't get it. You don't know who's in your presence. You're missing out on all the laws and the prophets that have been pointing to my arrival. Please don't miss it. And, and, and what they really want, and you see this in the story, and you see the rich man saying this, he says, hey, go to my five brothers, Lazarus, the one whom God has, has, has blessed, the one whom God has been with, If you show up having been raised from the dead, they will change. And Jesus says, no, they won't. Now, how does Jesus know this? Well, Jesus actually had experienced this, not in his own dying and rising, but in the Gospel of John. I want to read you this story. You know this story well. This is not a parable. This is gospel. This is about the brother of Mary and Martha, whose name was Lazarus. As you recall, Lazarus dies. Jesus grieves. Jesus shows up. Mary and Martha are not super happy that he didn't get there in time to heal their brother. And then we read this. This is after Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. Therefore, verse 45, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin, kind of the Supreme Court of Israel. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and and our nation. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, spoke up, you know nothing at all. You do not realize, now listen to this prophetic line, 
you do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. If one is to die, the rest will live. He did not, verse 51, say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation and not only for the nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. And then this line, so from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Surely, if someone is raised from the dead, we will believe. Nope. Lazarus, literally, not the parable guy, the literal man, the brother of Mary and Martha, is raised from the dead. The Jewish people believe, but some of them go to the Pharisees and say, you're not going to believe what happened. And how do the Pharisees respond to that great and wonderful act that has happened with Lazarus being raised from the dead? We're going to kill Jesus. We're going to take him out. Not even a miracle like that will change people's hearts, which is really hard to believe. So what do we do in response to what God has done for us in Jesus? I find it fascinating that in Luke chapter 9 through 19, as we make our way to Jerusalem with Jesus, he uses the word repent, I think, eight or nine times in there. Never in the imperative voice. Jesus does not come yelling and screaming. Jesus tells stories. He tells stories about God's faithfulness and God's goodness. He pushes back on the religious authorities. But to those who are on the outside, he keeps talking about the graciousness and goodness of God hoping that they will see the generosity that God has for them and hoping that they will decide to follow Jesus. And so for us this day, as we think about this story, as we think about how God knew the name of Lazarus, and that God carried him to the very heights of the heavens. Do we understand that God knows us in the same way? That God loves us for who we are today? Whether we are on the side of the road, whether we are walking by, whether we are feeling blessings from above, God knows you, and God loves you. And God calls you by name. This is his generous offer. And then we must decide what to do with that. What do we do with God's generosity, with God's graciousness? Do we freely receive that? Lazarus had to do nothing to earn it or deserve it. Grace is a gift. We say as a church, we want you to experience and express the transforming love of Jesus. To experience that transformation of the heart. Let's not be like the religious leaders and harden our hearts to God's truth. But let's allow the power of Jesus to work in and through our lives, transforming us. So not only do we experience the transforming love of Jesus, but we also express it 
into our community, and into our world. Pray with me, please. God, we miss it sometimes, and we're, we're well aware of that. We miss the inbreaking of your kingdom. We miss the beauty of Jesus. We miss the generosity that you lavish upon us. And we're sorry. But Lord, we know who you are. We know the transformation that is possible. And Lord, for some of us, we just simply need to acknowledge that. Jesus, we need to get right with you. We need to follow you. We've hardened our hearts against you. And we simply want to receive and know that we are known and loved, that you call us by name. Lord, let us receive that great truth and let us rest in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.